Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. Uh, we're still going strong, well into week two. Uh, would encourage you to uh, make your presence known in the front and center of the room. Uh, we've got a great lineup with a couple of mayors coming shortly on a discussion panel, uh, and my colleague Ben is going to uh, walk us through um, some of this work on the research and innovation bridge. Uh, so to fill you in a bit on some of the whys and wherefores, um, then we've brought forward a number of different research and innovation agendas in recent years. Uh, they take different uh, approaches, different starting points, and have had different communities uh, inform them. Uh, but the City Research and Innovation Bridge does its best to link all of those documents together uh, and to uh, provide one unified overview of an approach to research and innovation that's both city-driven uh, and, and city-led, um, but as is the way of the Global Innovation Hub, uh, then also responds to core fundamental human needs. Um, some of that work has been ongoing since the original Edmonton Declaration uh, and work in Canada in 2018. Uh, since then, work to that activity in 2021 um, and now uh, work ongoing in 2022 with a number of partners of the Global Covenant of Mayors uh, to bring all of that activity together. And you'll hear from some of them uh, also later on during the session. So to get us started, that's probably enough from me, just by way of uh, context to get us underway. And um, Ben, come and tell us a little bit more about the Innovation Bridge uh, and the way in which uh, then that works. Over to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, thanks for introducing that, and good to see some familiar faces, uh, friends in, in the room. Um, hi, everybody. If you've not met yet, my name is Ben Hanse, Head of Research and Innovation with the Global Covenant of Mayors based in Brussels, as Andy was saying. Um, and today it's a really exciting day, actually, because this is a manifestation of nearly a half year's worth of work. The first time we had this discussion was with good friend Dennis Pamlin um, back at the SBs in Bonn. Um, in June. So this was born out of a need to make a few connections and make sure that we're continuing to bring the work around research and innovation as close as possible to cities. If you've not heard about the Global Covenant, very quickly, largest global alliance for city climate leadership, now counting more than 12,500 cities um, and, and now representing more than a billion people, uh, which now one out of eight billion people in total as of yesterday and a massive potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also to boost and bolster adaptive capacity in cities, which is also a big focus of this year's uh, COP. One of the core things that have come out through our work in partnership, you can see up there with UN Habitat uh, and co-sponsored with the IPCC last year at the Innovate for Cities conference, um, is a series of topics, priority gaps, uh, that cities themselves have come forward and said are the key pieces that need to be filled if we want to make progress towards the, meeting the goals and maybe even exceeding them of the Paris Agreement, right? In the inner ring, you have the sort of cross-cutting uh, topics, things that don't belong in any one thematic area, justice and equity, big topic this past two weeks, scale, digitalization, systems approach, right? The middle ring, focusing on some of those more traditional, though no less important, topical areas of finance, informality, uncertainty, um, built in green and blue infrastructure. And then this outermost ring, kind of propping all of this up, uh, is really around the ways in which we engage. Partnerships, uh, co-production of, of knowledge, um, being able to partner with different uh, sectors of society, levels of government, to implement city climate action um, that responds to needs. Alongside that, through uh, we, the City Research and Innovation Agenda, and I will say apologies to those of you who've heard this way too many times this past week, um, we have a series of policy-focused, policy-maker and process-focused questions, right? And those of you who have a background in policy, public policy, or even just business management will know none of this is, is, is new. 
um, but we catered it to the city context. So how do we build the evidence base for climate? Where does the data come from? And how do I put that all together in the context of uh, inventories, of risk and vulnerability assessments? How and for whom should we be prioritizing? So the for whom being an additional uh, component of the agenda in, in, in the last year, focusing on the equity piece, making sure that we're thinking about communities who are uh, either impoverished, marginalized, underrepresented, um, what have you, and making sure that they're part of the process. Taking the action itself, what should we do? What are the actions that we need to be implementing? And then, you know, the X billion dollar question is how do we finance and scale that action, not only within other cities in the same country or even the same district, um, but globally as well, and make sure that that continues to be regionally relevant. Um, one of the core things that, that we've come across, and this feels a bit criminal that I'm actually up here saying it, so I'll let Dennis say more about this on the panel, and, and Andy's gonna ask him a couple of targeted questions, I think. Um, but in our work with, with Dennis, with Mission Innovation, um, Net Zero Compatible Solutions Initiative, and RISE focused on a, a different approach, right? But one that still makes sense in the context of, of climate action, which is looking at core human needs, right? When we think about where we live, how we get to places, what we need to eat, right? These are all pieces of our lives that we need to have fulfilled in order to live, as Dennis says, I mean, he should put a copyright on this, a flourishing life, right? Um, and this, is, this approach is trying to reframe uh, the narrative from one of sectors into one of solutions providers and demand owners. Folks who need things at the ladder and folks who can provide resource, provide knowledge, partnerships, who can meet the needs that others have. And as you look at this, if this is the first time you're seeing it, you know, would love to get your thoughts on this. Of course, it's, a, it's an open conversation. Um, but in conversation with some of the cities and in initial phases of rolling this out together with Dennis and the team, we've seen that cities are both, or they can be both, right? There's a need, of course, for cities to have data, a need for them to take action, resource, uh, technical capacity to be able to implement actions at scale. But some cities are also uh, you know, wielding the solutions themselves. They've either piloted some of these solutions with other partners already. Um, they might have the governance structures that are already set up to be able to um, leverage this kind of innovation and this action. So thinking about moving from that static problem approach on the bottom left quadrant up to the top right quadrant where we move, if we talk in sort of IT terms in a more agile way, um, being able to expand the space for research, for innovation, for action. Um, Dennis, I hope that was at least 50% of the way okay to presenting this slide, but I'll, I'll give you the floor later, later in a bit. So then what we've done is the bridge itself, and so this is probably a little bit intimidating. This is the first time I've seen it blasted on a screen of, of this size. But what we wanted to do is take the agendas that you just saw from the Global Covenant, take the needs-based approach, and put them together, right? On the, I'm going to play this because it's actually a really neat um, uh, animation that our colleague Zara Asarkaniki from the University of Melbourne worked on together with Dr. Kathy Oak. Um, you'll see a series of overarching themes, urban planning and design, infrastructure, governance. Under those, a series of topical areas, right, within those themes, and then the core human needs themselves. So as I mentioned, and, and you can see more of this, of course, on the, the Net Zero Compatible Solutions Initiative website, shelter, nature, biodiversity, nutrition and health, um, mobility, uh, reducing or avoiding existential risk, social development and, and data. Within those, the subhuman needs, so there's a lot of categorization on, going on here, but it's all sort of organized and nested in that way. And then on the right, and there's just not enough space to list them all out in, in detail, but are the research and innovation g priority gaps that we just talked about within that wheel? that cities have said, we need to work on this if we want to meet Paris or maybe even exceed it. And so you'll see that each node has a series of connections out. We spent a lot of time, I think I lost my eyesight looking at this together with Dennis and several other colleagues, Zara and Kathy themselves, just making sure that the connections are correct. The thickness of the bars corresponds to the magnitude of the connections. The thickness of each node also corresponds to the number of connections that that node has, how many needs are connected to priorities and, and vice versa. All to say, right, that needs-based approach, brand new. 
at least for cities and the sort of city journey that we are supporting uh, the cities and signatories and the covenant to take on. But it's no different in the sense that as you pursue the research and innovation priorities that you've identified at local government level, you are also covering core human needs. And it's part of the formula to loop that in. We need to take it all into account and make sure that we're meeting these needs, these demands that local leaders are already thinking about and this is just a way to, to categorize that. And we'll hear a little bit from said local leaders um, right after this. Another piece that we worked on through this, um, through this uh, product is highlighting some of the policy levers um, and processes that can help address core human needs. What are the elements that potentially are most efficient? Now you'll see this, we jump straight from these, um, these policy processes and the five points of the Pentagon uh, straight to the, the core human needs themselves, which are represented by the lines. Um, and you might be asking how on earth we made that jump. Um, well, we already had policy processes mapped to each of our research and innovation priorities. And so if A equals B and then B equals C means that A equals C, um, we're able to sort of, again, make some general recommendations. We do need to add some specificity to this, but some general enough recommendations around where um, policy process can help um, bolster and strengthen uh, the provision of core human needs, especially at city level. And you'll notice there's already some parts that stand out, data and research at every stage of the process. It's fantastic actually because we've been saying this and sometimes it falls on deaf ears and here's a chart that kind of shows that at every step of the process and for every single core human need, we need to be able to have a strong and robust evidence base. So. And you'll see the, the report on the website. I have a QR code coming up on the next slide, so you can take a look at it in greater depth. And I should say, it's just to start. Um, but think of this slide as a bit of a next step slide. What do we want to do with the bridge? It, we want to make sure that we, we allow cities, governments to uh, improve the way in which they assess and prioritize actions according to needs, according to um, research and innovation gaps and processes be able to track towards action implementation, which they're already doing through reporting platforms. Um, but beyond that, actually help build some of that capacity going forward. Want to identify and target gaps for cross-sector solutions providers. So going back to that four quadrant chart, clearly articulate the challenges that are being faced by demand owners. And then of course, develop further research around. So this is not meant to be a static document. This is meant to be a living, breathing document. And of course, welcome other inputs um, from colleagues uh, uh, around the, the room. So that's sort of the bridge in a nutshell. Again, feel free to, to download the report using the QR code or, or just head over to the website um, and you can navigate over to the bridge itself. Um, you can play around with that chart that you just saw, the sort of sand key flow diagram and, and actually look at um, where each of the nodes flow into and you can download the report. If you have suggestions, recommendations on next steps and how we should improve that, um, please do let us know. Uh, otherwise, Andy, I think uh, happy to hand off back to, to you. Super, thank you so much, Ben, uh, for that excellent explanation. And I'd implore everybody to take a look at that uh, bridge uh, document and, and to uh, make the download. Um, although you have to laugh when somebody is telling you to navigate to the bridge and they're talking entirely about online documentation. Um, so for my next panel, I'd like to invite uh, two local leaders uh, to come up and join us. Uh, firstly, uh, Lord Mayor Anna Reynolds from Hobart, Australia. Um, a board member of the Global Covenant of Mayors, uh, but we'll get into a little bit more about the situation in that particular uh, city in a moment. And secondly, uh, Mayor George Youssef uh, from Menyes in uh, Lebanon, uh, who um, uh, are, uh, has been very active in terms of sustainable energy and climate action planning, um, and very engaged uh, with both uh, Covenant of Mayors Mediterranean uh, and the Global Covenant as well. So let me turn to you first, uh, Lord Mayor Reynolds. Uh, can you share a little bit about your approaches in, in tackling the core needs of your residents? Um, the Global Innovation Hub, where we're sat right now, is taking this approach that's based entirely on core human needs. Uh, so tackling shelter, food, uh, mobility. Um, and how do we really link action on those issues at local level and more broadly to climate action? Uh, 
That's uh, an incredibly big question for a city um, in terms of uh, the journey it's on uh, at any particular moment in time. I mean, I'm, I'm the uh, 70th mayor for Hobart, uh, the city uh, has been around for close to 200 years and so times are always changing and uh, the makeup of the council is always changing. Um, I, I, I worry a little bit that some of the, some of the things we're talking about are, are disconnected from the sort of brutal brutalities of democracy um, because we, we have strategic plans. Most smart, modern cities have professional staff, great strategic plans and then sub-strategic sub plans. They, they're aware of best practice around the world. Um, but then politics can get in the way and people's, uh, the demands of the public saying that this is more important than that's more important. So I think that we have to, in all of these kind of um, processes of trying to identify uh, ways that we meet the, the, uh, the needs of our communities, we have to recognise that in some ways it's not an orderly process. Um, it's, um, uh, I mean, there's, there's regulation is our number one driver, so the, the regulatory requirement to have certain standards of infrastructure and uh, we're, we're a beast of the state government that says you've got to do X, Y and Z. So that sort of comes first. Then there's sort of political pressures. Then there's public pressures. And then there's a little skerrick of space sort of left often for staff to start being innovative and think about new approaches and, and reach out with colleagues and see what's best practice and those sort of things. So I... Um, I just, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of sort of human political complexity to these, to, the, to that question. Um, I mean, I did have uh, in my notes when I was uh, preparing for this, I did, um, I did uh, note that we, we do, like again, a lot of modern cities do try and uh, attempt co-design, so working with um, particular people with lived experience. So we've got a um, we've got a a panel on homelessness called the Housing with Dignity Reference Group, which is made up of people who've lived experience of homelessness, and they give us advice about what to do with homelessness. So that principle of co-design with people with lived experience in the community, I think, is really important. And sometimes innovation comes from the most surprising places. It's not. Um, you know, it's it's it comes from it does come locally, and it comes when you least expect it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I guess the other really strong commitment, obviously, is working with partners um, locally, uh, whether that's state government, universities, other agencies, and we do a lot of that with our resilience resilience building work. No, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor Reynolds. And we'll come back in a moment just to talk in a little more detail about some of those partnership working uh, arrangements. But thank you for setting the scene very nicely there. And do agree with you that innovation uh, sometimes does come from the most uh, unlikely places or indeed circumstances. And we'll hear from uh, perhaps Mayor uh, Youssef, tell us a little bit about the situation in, in Menyes. And um, we've been talking over the past days about how the city has um, you know, been in an area very much uh, affected by crisis and, and conflict. Um, but tell us a bit about how you're using work on climate uh, to also address the needs of your residents. No. Yes. Thank, thank you for the invitation. You know, uh, the situation in Lebanon is very different from uh, Europe and Australia. Uh, our main objective now with uh, so much crisis in Lebanon is to uh, link uh, the pri uh, priority of uh, the municipality with human needs uh, by innovating and uh, 
ensure good quality of uh, life for uh, inhabitant. Uh, the municipality uh, uh, today manage uh, all basic needs and uh, work with uh, so much academic institution, uh, so much partners, uh, and we have uh, ongoing uh, four strategies and action plans. And uh, we manage all uh, basic needs uh, uh, and uh, we manage uh, our uh, resources in good uh, in good way for this uh, and in every every project uh, we work to in innovative way to reduce more and more our uh, co2 emission and go to our climate uh, resilience uh, objectives uh, and commitment with the covenant of mayors and other uh, other objectives and uh, uh, maybe go to the neutral city neutral city in, uh, in Minges. great thank you very much then we look forward to that you'll hear from some partners one of whom sitting not too far away from you and masamba from the global innovation hub uh, team just around the approach that they're promoting um, and it does very much uh, align with that. To come back to you, uh, Lord Mayor Reynolds, you s talked a little bit about some of those co-design and, and partnership arrangements. For you as a local leader, how have they delivered? How are they contributing? And where do you s scope to expand and do more with partners? So uh, I can speak to one particular example. I mean, basically, um, there's any organisation has so many overlapping partnerships, and that's you know, if you tried to map it, it'd be you know, it'd be a bit like your map um, <laughs> in terms of you know, there's there's people partner with their col their their fellow colleague um, in the next door council that does a similar job to them. Um, I, as a political leader, partner with um, a politician in another city or a municipality because we want to kind of drive an agenda. I mean, partnerships are individual and informal, obviously, and often they they do they do drive a lot of change because you've got the passion of people wanting to deliver change, and I think you can't underestimate that. Um, desire for the you know the, the passion for change the sort of campaigning element whether that's in city offices or city politicians or whatever that 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 is a big a big initiator of, of innovation but then you know then at a much more formal level there are there are regional organizations of councils there are associations you're part of there's you know I mean basically the whole local governments are incredibly one of the more complex uh, types of organisations I think that exist anywhere in the world. They're much more complex in lots of ways than businesses because they have multiple business units, they've got to deliver against laws and regulations but they've also got you know, this mass constituency uh, of, of the residents and they provide, I think our council of that services 55,000 people provides about 300 services. Um, so these are incredibly complex organisations and you simply can't get your work done unless you've you know, got someone that you're partnering with to make it easier or to help you deliver it. Um, but on a very specific climate change project that I thought I'd mention um, that is really exciting new initiative because we are um, a very bushfire prone city. Um, and I think all of us, including emergency services, think that when the, when the big fire comes, um, it will overwhelm government and emergency services. Like, I think in our, all of us know in our bones that's the reality, so, um, which is scary, but it's kind of true. Um, so we've got a new project um, about bu building resilient neighbourhoods uh, in bushfire-prone communities, uh, and it's federally funded, which is fantastic that the federal government have decided to fund this. It's quite well resourced and it's over three years and that's a big, you know, that's quite a nice 
length of time, because normally federal funding is, you know, a bit too short and not sort of certain enough. Um, and we're working with the University of Tasmania, who've done all sorts of uh, uh, work around community attitudes on whether they are safe and what the level of risk is. And, uh, and then we're also working with the fire service who sort of they bring in the uniform when we need to kind of really um, uh, engage the community on some of the messages that are, you know, that, are, that people respond to that sort of uniform telling them about issues. But really the idea there is we're actually trying to build the community's own ability to respond and the, the relationships in the neighbourhoods and... Uh, uh, ensure that that basically that those neighbourhoods have some of the tools that they will need in the face of a really severe um, fire event. No, great. Thank you for that and for diving into some of that det detail. Um, and, and I'm sure kind of innovative participation approaches. And one of the things that we're trying to emphasize is that not all of the innovation needs to be in technology. Um, we do need social innovation, um, innovation in terms of some of those processes and mechanisms to engage uh, community, business, and, and other groups. Um, and that's what some of the partnerships um, that we're trying to build both with the Innovation Hub, but some of the other partners that you're going to hear from in a moment to deliver. So, no, thank you for that. Yep. May Youssef, to come back to you, um, tell us a bit about some of the partnerships that you've been building and um, where you would like to do more. Uh, in all our projects, we have uh, partnership. We begin... Uh, uh, in connecting uh, stakeholders or partners to work together, uh, academic institution, NGOs, foundation, and stakeholders from uh, our city. Uh, th these, these partners work together and provide the municipality with strategies. Uh, strategies to resolve uh, uh, the needs of our in inhabitants and to innovate uh, in smart way and to more manage, uh, uh, manage our resources. After that, uh, the municipality play uh, the role to find uh, funding opportunities and apply to call for proposal and implement in the territory uh, a climate resilience project or economic growth uh, projects. Uh, in Lebanon, we have some uh, decentralized uh, system. Uh, the national level uh, or, national, uh, or national authorities uh, have only the role, a neutral role, like observer, only observer uh, for the, uh, the municipal uh, work. No, no, great. Thank you. And one of the other things we've been trying to innovate in is some of those governance frameworks and trying to link the local, regional and national levels together. The multi-level climate action playbook um, was launched yesterday, tries to identify some examples of success, um, but there's definitely plenty of scope for further innovation. I'm sure you'd both agree in the relationship between local government and, and national level. Um, and that's something that we'll continue to push and promote um, through the work that we're doing with this group of organizations here in the room. So please join me in thanking both of our local leaders. And I'm then going to invite to the stage uh, a series of partners, both of Global Covenant and in the Global Innovation Hub. So first up, uh, Dennis Pamlin, uh, who is Executive Director of the Mission Innovation Net Zero Compatible Solutions Initiative, uh, which I'm still practicing saying. Very good, thank you, Dennis. Um, next, uh, Masamba uh, Tioy, Project Executive of the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub, and a man who's probably worn one of these chairs out already during the course of the last uh, two weeks. Um, next, Puriya Saheli, ah, Saleh, sorry, wrong way around, uh, head of the Urban Research Team uh, in Ikle, World Secretariat, and uh, I should say a good friend and colleague of the Global Covenants of Mayors, co-chair 
of our research and innovation and technical working group. And then, if she's made it here, all right, she's incoming. Then we'll come to her last uh, colleague, Jip Rambelli, uh, director for the Global Urban Transitions Mission. So, Dennis, I'm going to come to you first uh, with a question. So, we're talking about needs-based approaches. So, why, why a needs-based climate innovation framework? Um, and how do we kind of add value to what other sustainability efforts and what you've just heard from those local leaders, what local governments are doing uh, today? Why the needs-based approach? Thank you. Well, I think there are two things to the need-based agenda. First of all, when we've been working with cities around the world, you talk to any policymakers, they care about their population. Of course, climate change is important, but by the end of the day, being able to provide for people is at the focus. So shaping an agenda around the capacity to provide flourishing lives, all of a sudden link in to a more core link to how they respond. That's sort of the first thing in terms of building that. And uh, building what Anna was saying earlier in terms of most city officials are over flooded with more things that they can handle. But there are those who are in charge of innovation. There are those who are setting up innovation hubs, incubators, accelerators to try to get their solution providers. By linking the climate challenge to those, then all of a sudden you get human faces, people who want, who, who drives by creating employment, who, who wants to get revenues to the cities by delivering on these solutions. Then all of a sudden it's not a risk management and cost saving that drives only, but also something about building the proud for the future and seeing that youth especially feels that it's. So, but the other part is also that if you look at the traditional perspective, you, you tend to be very narrow focused. So you look at the buildings, so you ask them to produce. You, you look at transportation, you say, how would we get fossil-free cars? But as we had our la launch with OCD yesterday, that's a very narrow focus. If you look at human needs, you shouldn't ask, how should you reduce your car driving? I should ask you, what do you need access to? Do you need access to health? Well, we can do that digitally. You need medicines. I can have drones delivering that to you. Uh, oh, do you need out walking? Instead of taking your car, we will build a green streak here so you can run in the center of the city. So all of a sudden you bring in other stakeholders and other ex excitement um, sort of solution providers into the agenda instead of asking people, you should reduce, you should reduce, you invite people and saying, who are coming up with these solutions? So it's both on the innovation side, but also on the human side that people are used to work with that. And you open up so many other parts of the local governments that are focusing on building the city and encouraging innovation, and not just those who are tasked with reducing emissions and keeping compliance. Both are needed, but I think this new chapter is open up also well aligned with the broader thinking that this is an industrial revolution. This is a massive change and we don't really know how to do these things. And the last thing I would like to add also is that it also helps link to the fact that we are 8 billion yesterday, soon to be 9, 10, 11. How do we bring the solutions that inefficient? Because uh, the mayor from Lebanon, for instance, and many others, they live with very little resources. And we in the rich part of the world, we can't just say we need carbon free unsustainable solution. We need much more resource efficient solution to allow people to move out of poverty globally and have a flourishing future together. Not feeling that this is an exclusive uh, agenda for the rich middle class to offset themselves with unsustainable lifestyles. I'll end there. Thank you very much. And I saw Masamba smiling when you were talking about drones delivering pharmaceuticals. So I kind of want to ask him what he thinks about that. Maybe you can answer that in a second. But Masamba, tell us um, about the work that the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub is doing to link cities together with or solutions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, as I say always for the uh, UN Climate Change Global Innovation Hub, Cities are very important because they are close to people. And the main purpose of the Global Innovation Hub is to enhance the effectiveness of the use of innovation to serve 
people and planet. Now, to facilitate that, we are encouraging cities and uh, alliance of cities such as GCOM to um, paint the future they want for citizens, their children, and their grandchildren. That's the starting point. We need to know what, where we want to be for the short, medium, and longer term, and what are the needs. So for example, we want cities that are productive of climate and sustainability solution, rather than just being extractive. We want cities that are regenerative, rather than being destructive. We want cities that are empowering, rather than cities that are alienating. So we want cities that invest in a long life learning, where uh, learning is available for all, uh, everywhere, and, and, and all the time, thanks to enhanced accessibility to learning, um, enhanced diversity for learning, and also enhanced sustainability for, for learning. So we want also cities being able to provide flourishing life to their citizen. And uh, we want them to be um, able to address all the core needs that are expressed by um, their citizen. But we know that the solutions that are required to implement this vision are not necessarily available to all cities now. And um, this is where most of the time we have problem because the climate actor have the tendency to set their target and their goal based on what they perceive as possible because in their mind, if they do not do so, they will not be credible because if you take a bold target and then you are asked how will you get there and you do not have the solution, people tend to consider that it is not credible. And actually, it is not the case. We want people to set target and uh, a goal that are based on what is needed and not based on their perception of what is possible. And the gap between the two is precisely what innovation is uh, meant to, to fill. So what we are really encouraging strongly is to have cities having this ambitious target and translating the gap into demand for climate and sustainability solution. And then we would like to see all this demand for climate and sustainability solution arising from individual cities being aggregated into one single global demand for climate and sustainability solution from cities. And uh, we are really inviting GCOM as well as all the city alliance to work on that because this is only if we have this global demand for climate and sustainability solution shared by all cities that we can really have radical collaboration among cities because they will work on the same problem and without radical collaboration and without radical collaboration there is no way of addressing the challenge of sustainability and climate that we are facing we need to have cities having common approach share vision, share sense of purpose, because this is only when this is the case that they will have the cement that binds them together. And this is only when this is the case that they will have the understanding of the need for collective, coordinated approach through organizations such as GCOM or ICLE. And this is only if they are working on share uh, issue, one single global demand for climate and sustainability so solution, that cities will understand the need to subordinate individual interest to the common global interest. Back to you.
Thank you, uh, Masamba, uh, for that. And I hope now, uh, Puria, we can segue, uh, and, and as I said to somebody on a panel this morning, now follow that. Uh, so uh, as co-chair of the Global Covenants Research and Innovation Technical Working Group, uh, that's bringing together a number of the key city alliances uh, that have been mentioned, um, together with some of their partners. How do you see that partnership and, and group of organizations uh, involving, uh, uh, evolving? And how do we then kind of link to and involve this work on bridging human-based uh, approach to the existing uh, global research and action agenda and city research and innovation agenda? To you. Um, thanks so much, Andy. I guess I have not much to share uh, because Masamo is still all my lines. <laughs> um, so um, the reality is uh, City Research and Innovation Agenda and Global Research and Action Agenda and the updated version uh, are a culmination of hundreds of hours of work with city practitioners, uh, community of practice, uh, innovators, uh, and, and policy makers. And I believe uh, that is basically a very solid foundation in terms of local governments taking the next step, hand in hand with uh, academy, uh, academia and, and uh, community of innovation, but also other stakeholders uh, to address the existing, and, and, uh, existing challenges, particularly in this increasing uh, complex uh, sort of urban systems. And not, not only uh, the interface of research and policy and practice, but also uh, in terms of ambition versus implementation. Uh, in turn, uh, the needs-based uh, climate innovation framework based on an expanded climate innovation agenda is grounded on uh, human needs, uh, particularly core human needs, leverages uh, the offerings and possibilities of force industrial revolution uh, to help cities, local governments, citizen businesses uh, shift their role from uh, static reducers of uh, GHG emissions to um, generators and exporters of solutions, right? At the same time, we all know that this is a time for action. Uh, if you look into the IPCC 2022 uh, mitigation report, uh, we understand that uh, GHG emission globally is expected to, pit, uh, to peak uh, based on the globally modeled pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, however, if there's no immediate action and the strength of policies, it's going to increase even beyond 2025, which pains me to say, but it will probably lead to a uh, median global warming of 3.2 degrees. And this is science, right? Um, on the other hand, we heard from our colleagues, the IPCC lead author Felix Kvoitz yesterday, uh, that with uh, effective policies, improved infrastructure, and integrating technology for behavioral change, there's a huge possibility and feasibility of reducing 40 to 70 percent of uh, GHG emissions by, by 2050. So now the question we need to look into is what is obstructing basically uh, achieving this target? Um, so uh, with that question, I believe uh, what are the ways that GCOM Alliance and its partners can, can support uh, addressing this challenge is uh, a combination of GRAA and CRAA with this human needs approach in the sense of leveraging these cross-cutting issues outlined in updated GRAA. I see our uh, lovely Deborah Roberts is, uh, is there um, and, and uh, we benefited a lot from her knowledge and expertise. But I believe we can use those six uh, cross-cutting issues as a guide to ask more fundamental questions and uh, sort of uh, uh, try to innovate and provide solutions for the causes rather than symptoms, for a transformative change rather than the type of change that will reinforce the status quo, right? So let's take the, uh, this example of um, transportation. Yesterday, a colleague from OECD was highlighting a fact based on the work that they have done that there is a correlation between uh, income, well-being, and use of uh, electric mobility. So if we look into this particular example, we understand that this is not going to provide the scale of change that we need to address the climate change. And therefore, we need to take a step back and address the access instead of uh, mobility. Um, therefore, uh, I believe if, if we 
could really uh, look into this approach and, and uh, leveraging this identified gaps and priorities, cross-cutting issues, and grounded it in human needs and trying to mainstream, but also to the point that Masambo mentioned in terms of uh, partnership building and the scaling of this partnership, we definitely have a lot of opportunities to achieve our collective goals. And on that, I believe we can build upon this work that we have been doing with partners so far. And I'm very much looking forward to Innovate for Cities conference next year to build upon all this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Puria. Uh, you, you've kind of let the cat out of the bag on the fact that there might be an Innovate for Cities conference next year. We were saving that announcement for later, uh, but it's all good. Uh, the more that people hear it, uh, then the more they'll be inclined to attend. Um, I, I was uh, chastising a group of multi development banks uh, in events in their pavilion earlier um, for having an entirely male panel. Uh, so apologies in our audience, our, our, our female panelist uh, is still en route. So we will for a, a few minutes to arrive um, and to uh, get settled in. Um, then would anybody from the audience uh, like to ask any of the, the partners um, in the research and innovation agenda and the bridging work a question? And if not, I'm going to give the microphone to Ben for a second. <laughs> Ah, there is. Great. So I have a question actually from the previous, from your presentation. Uh, so you talked about uh, the core human needs. So I have two questions actually. The, my first question was, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't see clothing in core human needs enlisted anyway. So what was the reason that it was not listed uh, as uh, the core human need? That clothing was not there because when we talk about basic human rights, it's food, clothing and housing. So why it didn't feature in there? So that was my first question. My second question was, what uh, would you say about the critics who argue that when we talk about human needs approach, it uh, basically caters to charity instead of uh, look, because the terminology is very important when we talk about policy making. And why not focus on rights which translates into the matter of uh, uh, dignity and, and getting it. So why needs and why not rights? And the first one was why clothing didn't feature into the list. And I understand it is dynamic in nature, but still. Great questions. I do think Dennis is best place to answer that one. So I'll pass to him if you don't mind. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, the reason is that clothing fits under shelter. Because if you look inside, you can either have a comfortable temperature by putting on a sweater or turning up the temperature. So clothing itself is not a core human need. It's part of a shelter or it's a facilitator for an outdoor environment or something. And most of the problem we have today, and the reason we did that was also to provoke, because most of the textile and fashion industry is actually not providing any core human needs at all. They're trying to um, disempower people into consumerism. Uh, so the, the marketing is about feeling insecure and f finding identity towards fast fashion clothing. I don't know if you've seen, over the last 20 years, the size of the, the, the wardrobes have almost doubled and the lifetimes have shrank. Not because any core human needs, but because we have created false human needs in that. So therefore we wanted to bring that in and say that if you bring a clothing, you need to explain is that helping you get access so it's comfortable so you can pick up your children at school or protecting you from rain so you don't need to take the car? So that's a, sort of, we really want to have those sort of deeper questions on how do we frame this so we don't just say, oh, we, we need better clothing. No, we need to ask, what do we really need? Because clothing is providing different kind of needs. That's the same thing as access. It's also access to something. We will always need cl clothing. We will always need access to things, but how, how that relates. I, I was going to ask Masamba if he had anything to add, but while he thinks about that, uh, maybe the follow-up question. Uh, so my underlying question for the clothing not included was also because we are looking at cities here, right? And uh, most of the cities in developing world have slums. So, and most of the, a lot of people in the cities, the, in fact, like the majority of the people living in the cities and big cities lives in slums. So they are not the targeted individuals when we talk about this fashion industry in that point even though we have like a lot of mobile phone penetrations in developing Asia and, and global south but uh, so if you're thinking about and you mentioned outdoor as well right so if and housing is indoor so that part is covered but for outdoors and people who are not who are not going to Paris fast fashion events every year or Paris fashion week 
So does that make an impact by not including clothing into basing human uh, uh, services or needs here, or, uh, or it doesn't? No, no, it's exactly highlighting these kind of differences between the global north and global south also. That is so important because we need to get there people who provide clothing to discuss where is it really needed, where does it provide a shelter. Uh, now the global clothing industry totally ignore basically the south uh, and just cater to the global north. So it's exactly that kind of hidden ad innovation agenda that we want to highlight. Uh, because the basic focus we have is 11 billion people living flourishing lives. So that's also asking us that the current clothing industry is pushing us in the north to have enormous wardrobes while at the same time not providing for the real needs that clothing could provide in the global south. So it's exactly that kind of global perspective also that we hope to collaborate with uh, Global Covenants of Mayors and others. Because if you live in the global north, you might not think about that textile industry you have in your city. But if you bring in this global sustainability perspective, you need to ask your textile industry, are you really developed that is compatible with the future and export? Because 80% of the world's population will live in Africa or Southern Asia. So you should really consider those people, both from a human perspective, but also from an economic perspective, because these people will, in one way or another, move out of poverty. And hopefully not with a war over natural resources, but in collaboration as we create these new smart solutions that I think Masamba and others from the UN is really trying to focus on, that this is a global collaborative approach. And that's why we're so excited to also work with the city. I think Many cities have more of a collaborative thinking. Many governments are still in a sort of net zero thinking on when they negotiate and work. As Anna was talking about, it's an informal network between different mayors of people that both focus on their population. So that's a little bit, you know, but we're open for discussion. If you think there's benefits for including that, as Ben said, let's include that then and see what, are, what, what happens then. Because this is not written in stone, it's just a way of trying to really tease out the real in deep innovation. And I want to add that also, when we talk about uh, yesterday, we're not just talking about core humanism, or, well, or core being expanded. Art and culture and science is also part of core human needs for us. But we also need to ask, who are driving the needs? When I see I need something, and that's what we work with OECD about, someone is helping us, and a city, local city, they've been influenced by a global internet culture now with advertising for how, what is a need for you. So it's also, I think, a global collaboration between cities about challenging that, that is really shaping the future needs of society. Thank you very much. Um, Masamba, anything you wanted to add on the Global Innovation Hub's framework? No, I just would like to uh, insist on the fact that the main purpose really here is to differentiate between purpose and means. What we are saying is before using innovation to improve a means, let's first check whether we, can, we cannot use innovation to replace and disrupt a means if this means is not aligned with the climate and the sustainability goal. It's why the idea is really to go to the ultimate need, the purpose that means are satisfying, and then start asking whether innovation can be used to support alternative way of satisfying these needs that are more aligned with the climate and sustainability goal. Thank you, uh, Masamba. Uh, and a warm welcome to uh, Urban Transitions Mission uh, her Director, Georgia Rambelli. Uh, perhaps warmer uh, than you might like. But um, <laughs> uh, then the Urban Transitions Mission is trying to now take a cohort of, uh, announced as 48, but I think we can now say uh, verbally 50 cities. Yes. Uh, then on a transition uh, towards net zero, uh, tell us a little bit about how both this work on the innovation bridge and the research uh, agendas are helping those cities to move more rapidly towards those climate neutrality goals. Over to you. No, thank you very much and apologies for joining only now. I feel that the innovation that I need at the moment is either teletransportation or longer days or I'm not quite sure, but maybe cloning myself into, I think everyone is feeling a little bit this, uh, uh, this, this challenge these days at COP. So just a few words about the Urban Transitions mission. Uh, 
as rightly Andy mentioned, we are looking into engaging with a number of cities from across the world to really work together, test and deliver on their pathways to net zero as soon as possible. We have a T30 as a target that we would like to put out there, but of course, very much in line also with what is possible and what the needs and what the context is for each city on the ground. We have announced yesterday, uh, on Monday, sorry, uh, our first cohort of 50 cities. This is for this year, the one that we will start to work with to test frameworks that are out there to provide guidance step by step throughout their city climate action journey to really support them in understanding what the gaps are uh, in terms of what they need to further the research and innovation, but in particular to future-proof the, the, the strategy, the actions that they have already included into their plans so that we can focus directly into delivering the acceleration that is needed and utilize innovation as the key to unlock some of these solutions that are on the ground. So this, the, the transition mission is very much about, of course, uh, bringing together a partnership across different sectors and I think this is the first connection point that we have with of course the, 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 the research innovation agenda and the bridge uh, between these agendas that we've been talking about so far we will we aim to work together with local policymakers but also to bring on board national policymakers, private sector uh, business as well as of course academia and research to try to deliver solutions together on these gaps that are there the second element, which is really closely related to what has been discussed on this panel, is of course that when we talk about innovation, uh, within our urban transitions mission, we are looking into not only technological innovation, but very much looking into regulatory challenges as well as economic challenges that we can face on the ground so that we can assess not only what is the best technology that is there, maybe the technology is the solution, but very often we know that the issues for our cities are very much related to their context. So we want to analyze their plans, assess their priorities, help them future-proof their strategy and their action, and find the innovation that feeds, feeds very much their need, so really closely, to help them taking that extra leap. Amazing, thank you, brilliantly done. Um, and, and very much with you on that contextualization um, piece. We heard about some of that from Lord Mayor Reynolds and Mayor Youssef earlier. Um, and just some different examples of local circumstances that they're facing. It will be interesting uh, to work with this group of 50 leading cities and um, to draw out learnings both on the process that they're going through and the role of innovation within that, um, as well as the goal that they're trying to achieve. Please. Just one more thing. 50 cities for this year, but we are looking for 250 more next year. So if anyone <laughs> is interested in this room, we look forward to engaging with you from the local governments, but also, of course, across sector as partners. Great, thank you. I know there's at least one in this room that's potentially interested to see how it goes with the first group and, and then join in. Uh, but yes, uh, we hope there are many more. So uh, Ben talked at the beginning about navigating your way to the bridge. Uh, I would encourage you to do exactly that. Uh, if you missed it earlier, uh, there's the QR code for the City Research and Innovation Bridge uh, document. Uh, thank you to the Global Covenants Research and Innovation Technical Working Group um, for their work, um, in particular to colleague um, Ben, to Puria, um, Dennis, uh, Masamba, Georgia, and others who have fed into that activity. Um, take a look, give it a read, but most of all, continue to uh, collaborate in radical ways, uh, both within this space in the time that remains, um, but also far beyond the confines of COP27. Thank you very much.